The Senate will now consider the proposal from Senator Hughes, which is also shown at item 12 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? Thank you. With the concurrence of the Senate, the clerks will set the clock in line with the informal arrangements which have been made by the Whip. Senator Hughes, you have the call. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, the government has made some very grand promises to the people of Australia before the election. They were promises that we on this side warned were either ineffective or not so simple to implement. But this Labor Party and the Prime Minister said, let's throw caution to the wind turbines. We'll just legislate now and work out how it all works later. And until then, we'll just blame everybody else. Well, sadly, those empty promises worked and the electorate bought them and got them into government because these lofty goals understandably sounded wonderful. But once again, we've seen the reality that Labor has no real plan. Labor has no detail, only ideology. And when that ideology hits reality, well, then we know what Labor does next. It comes for your hard-earned money. It uses your income to prop up its own failures. This government has had more than enough time now to either deliver or come clean to the Australian people on its election promises. They said, we'll bring down your mortgages. But all Labor has managed to do is make a mess. To deal with inflationary pressures, we have seen nine consecutive interest rate rises. Nine. But when the Treasurer and the Prime Minister would rather write essays and go to music festivals than work in tandem with the Reserve Bank to bring down inflation, what else can you expect? As Australians with mortgages buckle under the pressure of a tenth consecutive interest rate rise, the Albanese government's only solution is to break promises and increase taxes. A person with a typical mortgage of $750,000 is now paying $1,700 more per month than they were when interest rates started rising in May. That's an extra $20,000 a year to the average Australian family. Interest paid on mortgages grew by 23% during the December quarter. Families are therefore being forced to pull back on other spending and household savings are plummeting. Many, many mortgage holders are starting to feel the pinch. They're struggling to find the money necessary to just make the repayments. So what we're staring down the barrel of is an increased number of defaulted loans in the months ahead. Australians are being forced to tighten their belt on their budgetary spending as household bills continue to skyrocket. Research has shown that nearly half of all Australians have cut back on purchasing things like takeout, while a third have resorted to buying less meat and seafood. So why is this government sending the country back to the dark ages? I mean, that could become a literal statement this winter if energy prices and supply continue down the path they're on. Blackouts for the East Coast. Australians have been warned by IEMO that there'll be energy rationing and blackouts in the coming years due to the early retirement of coal and gas generators, along with construction delays to Snowy 2.0 and the Curry Curry gas plant. When the coalition left office, there was no reliability gap. Labor's lost control of Australia's energy system. This government has harped on about championing the cause of the elderly, but we've seen more deaths in aged care, care than during the first two years of the pandemic under this government's watch. More deaths in aged care since this government came to power than during the first two years of the pandemic. Just let that sink in. They're hard numbers. They're not things you can fudge they're not something you can yell about and point the finger backwards. These are hard figures. More people have died in aged care since you came to government than occurred during the first two years of the pandemic. That is the hard, cold truth. And the reality is, though, as we head into this winter, and it's an absolutely appalling thought, these blackouts that are being predicted, this energy shortage, this supply shortage, I sincerely hope it is not a very, very cold winter because very cold winters, high energy prices, budgetary pressure on family incomes means people don't put the heater on. And what does that mean for the elderly? It means there will be deaths. We know that there are dire consequences when elderly Australians do not provide heating for themselves in their home because they cannot afford to do so. And that will be firmly 
and squarely on the shoulders of those opposite due to their recklessness, the fact that they have no plan, and when they do attempt anything, it is market intervention that is going to make every single problem worse, as market interventions all too often do. Senator Foley. I'm proud to be part of the Albanese Labor government. Why am I proud? It's because we are addressing the mess that those people opposite created over nine very long years. It's all very well for us to have a fairy tale contribution to this debate, and next it will be goblins and witches that are going to come out and, the, and we're going to rewrite history once again. But the reality is we were left with a trillion dollar debt. That's what those opposite left for the Australian people, not just the Labor government, but the Australian people. Trillion dollar debt. And then we had a contribution just then about aged care. I'm gobsmacked. I really am. That anyone from that side of the chamber would come in here and question Order. and question the Labor government's commitment to aged care after 10 months of being in government. And what have we seen on that side? What we saw over nine years was a failed government, five ministers who failed in aged care over nine long years. They were so bad they had to call a royal commission into their own failings. And what has Labor done since we came into office? We have put respect, proper care, we want to put nurses back into residential aged care. These are the things that we are doing. We are addressing, and there's no getting away from the, the fact that, yes, there is a cost of living crisis. People are doing it hard. If you are really sincere about addressing this crisis, then you would support the Housing Future Fund. That's what you do on that side of the chamber because the biggest cost Senator of Polly, living crisis for the Australian you, community. Order, remind you to put your remarks through the chair. I wasn't talking to anyone. I was saying those on that side of the chamber. But I, Senator if you Polly, think I you did. You were using the word you several times. You. Address your remarks through the chair. I, I then apologise, Chair, uh, President, Acting Deputy President. But the reality is those opposite, those under Mr. Dutton will not agree to supporting the Housing Future Fund, which will change the opportunity to get women and children off the street into their own home. Order. It will get older women off the street from being forced into living on the street. It will also ensure that women who are leaving domestic violence situations, you can't come in here and do your fake tears when it suits you, these are real issues that are facing the Australian community. People cannot afford the rent. They cannot get affordable housing. Support Order. the legislation that is coming before this chamber. Then you will actually have a reason to come in here and you can make your contribution. But if you're not prepared to help resolve the issue, you can't just come in here blaming the whole world events is on this government after 10 months. But what we have done since we've come into government, we have reduced the cost of medicine. We have put forward cheaper childcare that Order. will benefit $1.2 million. Polly, Senator Polly, resume your seat. Standing Order 197, interjections disorderly. Senator Hughes, you've had your opportunity to make a contribution. Senator Polly will be heard in silence. Senator Polly. Thanks for that protection. I don't really need it because I know when they start interjecting, you know that the truth hurts on those on that side of the chamber. We will be introducing electricity bill relief with the key feature of the May federal budget. Direct support for households and businesses that the opposition tried to block. Let's put this on the public record. They tried to block it. We have invested 180,000 fee-free TAFE places that are now available to tackle the skill shortages, unlike the previous government. And we know from the contribution that was made in question time today that the, uh, the attributes that was displayed by those when they were in government 
of having a finance minister, and then he didn't even know that the Prime Minister had taken over his portfolio, come in here and try and lecture us about the cost of living and what needs to be done for the economy. Now, we know that there has been difficulties. We know that some of that has been contributed to the Iraq war and what's happening there in terms of energy prices. But those on that side had nine years to come up with an energy policy. They had 26 of them, but delivered not one. Not one. So you can rewrite your fairy tales as often as you like when you come into this chamber, but the Australian people, they saw right through you. They are reliant on the leadership of Anthony Albanese and the Labor government who will do what is necessary to protect and to support those doing it tough in this country. Well, your time has expired. I just remind senators to address remarks through the chair and to address members of the other chamber by their correct title. Senator McKim, you have the call. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, I've got a memo for the Labor Party, and that is this. People voted for change at the last election. People voted in a new government because they wanted you to be different to the former government. But what have we got? We've got more of the same from a Prime Minister who every day is looking more and more like Scott Morrison light. Because Labor is pushing Senator, ahead. Senator McKim, I've just reminded senators about using the correct titles for members in the opposite house. Well, you can't use someone's full name anymore, Deputy President. Is that your ruling? You either need to use a title or their seat that they represent. You can't use their full name? Not alone, no. That's never been the case. Senator McKim, you have the call. Well, memo to the Labor Party. People voted for change at the last election, and what that means is they wanted the government to be different to the former government. And what you've got is a Prime Minister who is just more and more every day looking like a pale version of the former Prime Minister. You've got a Prime Minister who jets overseas to hand over $368 billion dollars worth a new submarine deal where he is, as former Prime Minister Keating said, the only one paying. But of course it's the Australian taxpayers who are actually paying. You've got a Labor Party that is pushing ahead with the $250 billion worth of tax cuts for the wealthy that were put on the table by the former Prime Minister, Mr Morrison. You've got a Labor Party that is pushing ahead with the safeguard mechanism, a policy designed to fail by the former LNP government. And all the while, interest rates are going up in contravention of a direct promise made by the RBA, and real wages are going backwards at the fastest rate on record, faster than they were going backwards under the former government. I mean, how can the Labor Party look the people in the eye who voted for them and defend tax cuts for the wealthy and a $368 billion expenditure on nuclear submarines. They are ghastly, indefensible po policies and they perpetuate social in injustice and they will make it harder for everyday Australians to get by. Poverty doesn't have to exist in this country. It is a political choice that policy exists in this country, and it is a choice that wasn't only made by the LNP, who I would expect every time to make that choice. It's now a choice being made by the Australian Labor Party, because they would prefer to give tax cuts to the wealthy than to end the prospect of someone starving on income support in this country. That's how far the Labor Party's fallen. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I thank Senator Holly Hughes for uh, bringing this very important matter before the Senate here today, an opportunity for us to make a contribution as senators. And I stand today uh, in solidarity with uh, everything that Senator Hughes uh, said in her uh, contribution. Uh, we are in the midst of a cost of living crisis, that's for sure. 
Uh, every Australian is experiencing that. Obviously, some uh, far more than others, uh, but it is a crisis, and I, I don't think that is putting too strong a word on it. I don't tend to use language, uh, uh, the alarmist sort of language. Uh, I try to be as measured as I can. Sometimes I have a little flourish here and there, but uh, it is a crisis that Australians are facing. Uh, cost of living is, no doubt, the number one issue, the number one issue that Australians are facing. Now, when the government was in opposition, they repeatedly said that they were going to make cost of living easier, easier for Australians. Well, it's clear that the Albanese government has no plan at all to deal with this cost of living crisis or indeed inflation. I mean, inflation is running out of control. And I don't think there's been a single policy that this government has brought forward yet that goes to addressing it. They've left it all up to the RBA, the RBA, who will just put interest rates up, which of course impacts uh, the, the amount of money that people have in their household budgets because their mortgages have gone up. But they're not doing anything to reduce inflation by putting downward pressure on government expenditure. Uh, they've said that uh, wage growth should match inflation so people don't go backwards. Now, with no plan at all to place downward pressure on inflation and chasing inflation with wage rises, inflation is only going to continue to rise. Now, as I said, instead of working in tandem with the Reserve Bank to bring down inflation, the government is putting all its energy into breaking election promises and taxing Australians more. Now, someone that would know something about the impact that Australians are facing, particularly those that are in, on lower to middle incomes, uh, is the Salvation Army. And the Salvation Army's general manager of policy and advocacy, uh, Ms. Jennifer Cacaldi, said, what we have found is that the people who are already doing it tough are now experiencing extreme hardship. The people we work with, especially those reliant on government payments, are making impossible decisions between food and rent or essential medicines and school supplies for their children. Now, the current situation is unsustainable, she said. Immediate action is needed to relieve pressure on the most disadvantaged in our community. But everything that this government does, frankly, is only making matters worse. We're now up to the 10th consecutive interest rate rise. An Australian with a typical mortgage of $750,000 is paying $1,700 extra per month. That's $20,000 per year. And late last year, the government hurried in their new enterprise bargaining laws just before Christmas, claiming it as a Christmas present. Well, it was only a Christmas present for the union movement. It certainly wasn't a Christmas present for workers for people that were struggling to pay that extra $20,000 a year on their mortgage. And what we've seen is the Productivity Commission just this last week tell us in its five-year productivity inquiry that new multi-enterprise agreements pose some risk that could constrain productivity growth and hence the scope for enduring real wage rises over time, forcing unwilling employers or employees into multi-enterprise agreements uh, in which they had no bargaining role may limit these shared productivity and other benefits. This may not just affect individual employers, but employees too may relinquish beneficial changes in working arrangements or higher wages. So this government is actually putting in place policies that is increasing hardship on families, increasing hardship on families, just because they needed to pay their masters within the union movement, just because they don't actually understand how to manage an economy, to put downward pressure on inflation. And what we're seeing is this government is unwilling to make tough decisions. They'll just allow Australian households instead to bear all the burden. Order. Senator Roberts. President Ronald Reagan once said, quote, the top nine most terrifying words in the English language are I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Yeah. The words, I'm from Labor and I'm here to help with your cost of living, are even more terrifying. Labor lied and promised the world to get elected to government on less than a measly third of the vote. 
Instead of a labour utopia with rainbows and unicorns, Australia is waking up nearly a year later with a mother of all hangovers. Inflation is roaring out of control. Mortgage payments have skyrocketed. Fuel's still $2 a litre. We've just grown to expect it. And electricity bills are positively shocking, driven higher by climate policies, pushed by both major parties. We said it wouldn't be easy under Albanese. I don't think anyone thought it would get this bad this fast. Yeah. Or Senator be this Order. arrogant this fast. Senator Roberts, remember you need to address members in the other chamber by the correct title. Thank you. One Nation advocates getting back to basics on energy, taxes, manufacturing, food production and value-added mining. Richest country in the world, uh, let's the use the resources for the people. Expired. Senator White. The government understands that the rising cost of living is hitting a lot of uh, Australians hard. The Prime Minister and the Treasurer know that it's not easy. The government knows that it isn't easy. I know that it isn't easy. The Australian people understand that we didn't create these challenges, but Australians elected us to take responsibility for addressing these challenges, and we are. After 10 years of failed energy policies, 10 years of Liberal Party debt, 10 years of wages either stagnated or going backwards, backwards Australians had had enough. Now we're embarking on the long road of trying to right the ship after the Liberals, trashed, uh, the Liberals national government trashed our country for the best part of a de decade. We have heard a lot about electricity prices recently from the opposition. I want to talk about en energy prices too and put on record what is really going on. Last year the Albanese government legislated to, to, to cap wholesale energy prices on coal and gas. We did that in large part because we had to deal with a wasted decade of failed energy policies from the coalition. We did it in part to respond to the the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which has put enormous pressure on global energy markets. We called the Parliament for Christmas to deal with this situation. The government took it seriously and acted. We legislated the Energy Price Relief Plan. Now, just three months later, we are already hearing from the Australian energy regulator that it has, had we not acted when we did, energy prices would be 40 to 50 per cent more expensive than they are now. Without the gov that government intervention, Australian families would have paid an extra 300, sorry, $530 for energy. Without the government's intervention, Australian businesses would have paid an extra $1,243 um, per year for energy. That is what real action to address the cost of living is about, uh, and that is what it's about for Australians. When given the chance to support cheaper pro power prices, the coalition said no. When asked if they would support Australian households and business by st stabilising the energy market, the Liberal and National Party said no. The coalition voted against cheaper energy prices and voted against support for Australians feeling the sting of inflation. If the coalition had been in charge, Australians would be paying hundreds of dollars more for electricity than they currently are. What makes it worse is that, that it was their 20 failed energy policies over a decade of inaction that put us in this mess. When we came to government, there was no plan from the coalition to deal with what was coming down the pipeline. No plan to deal with high domestic wholesale energy prices. No plan to shore up and stabilise our domestic energy market, even though the war in Ukraine had been raging for months when they were in government. And now it's up to us to fix the mess, and that is what the Albanese government is doing. More than just stabilising power prices, we are taking action to both fix the budget and provide Australians with targeted cost of living relief. Our budget focused on responsible cost of living relief that didn't put extra pressure on inflation. That's the most important thing. What we're also doing is cheaper childcare, expanding paid parental leave, cheaper medicines, more affordable housing and getting moving, uh, wages moving again. Getting mo wages moving uh, in particular is important in the face of the inflation challenge. The Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill that the government legislated last year is already doing that. Employers and employees are sitting back down at the bargaining table in good faith and re reviewing their arrangements. Zombie agreements that were way out of date and unfair are gone, and that is a very good thing because the, there were many more out there than we first thought. We also gave the Fair Work Commission the ability to facilitate industry-wide and collective low-paid bargaining. This will give the lowest paid workers in society who need the most help an opportunity to get a pay rise. It really is a bit rich that the co coalition raises what we are doing.
doing to address the cost of living and responding to inflation. Their track record is one of saying no and distorting the truth about their 10 years in government. The Labor government is working every day um, to make Australia a more productive and fair place to live. We're working hard to solve problems and being honest with Australians. Australians recognise that the Albanese government has a plan in contrast to the coalition, which is why, as Taylor Swift would say, when it comes to the coalition, you've got to shake it off. And Australians at the last election did just that. Senator Babette. Thank you. As a member of Generation Y, I often hear older generations reflect on the late 1980s and home loan interest rates of 18 per cent. Now, I have no doubt that these were very tough times. Well, following 10 consecutive interest rate rises, excessive money printing and government debt accumulation, we now live in even tougher times. Now, the reason is quite simple. It's short-sighted government intervention that only stimulates the demand side of the equation and it has resulted in households which are overburdened with debt. It is an unsustainable reality of modern society. Now, economics reporter Stephen Johnson recently wrote that a rich Australian in the top 3.6 per cent of earners bringing in $180,000 a year is in more mortgage stress than an average income borrower who bought a typical home in 1989. Now, I urge the Treasurer to acknowledge that the government spending drives inflation and to put the brakes on now. We just can't take it anymore. Stop spending money. Your time has expired. Yeah. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, yesterday in question time, I asked Minister Farrell if the Labor government would deliver the 275 power bill reduction uh, they promised the Australian people no less than 97 times before the election. He didn't answer. I then asked if he would admit that the Labor government broke their election promise to make no changes to superannuation. We now know that one in ten Australians will be impacted by their superannuation changes, one in ten, far from the modest broken promise uh, that Minister Gallagher keeps talking about. But again, of course, he had no answer. I then asked if the minister would admit that his government broke yet another election promise to lower the cost of PBS medicines after they removed a life-changing uh, life diabetes drug from the PBS. That is a fact. And of course, he had no answer for this either. It is very clear that with this Labor government, as with every other Labor government, you never ever listen to what they say before the election and to the promises they make on what they will do and what they won't do, because there is nothing more certain, and this uh, government has now demonstrated that truism. They'll say one thing before the election and they'll do another thing afterwards. In fact, the very same Minister Farrell said in response in estimates to questions about the NDIS, he admitted on behalf of Minister Shorten that they said one thing before the election and suddenly uh, new facts were revealed that made them change their position and break promises. In this case, no cuts to the NDIS. So they say one thing and they do another thing. Now, let's have a look at the facts and how they say one thing, do another, and they break promises without shame. They promise to, to lower electricity prices, broken. The promise of cheaper mortgages, broken. The promises of no change to super, broken. The promise to lower inflation, broken. The promise that we're not touching franking credits, guess what? Broken. The promise that industry-wide bargaining is not part of our policy, we know that that was broken too. The list goes on and on. The promise that we will be doing our bit to assist real wage increases, broken. The promise not to raise taxes, broken. The promise to cut the cost of consultants and contractors, broken again. Western Australians who I represent in this place are seriously struggling already in less than a year under this Labor Party and this Labor government. Everything but everything is going up except their wages. There is no relief in sight. And listening to those opposite in this chamber again this week, they are blaming everybody else 
We didn't know the state of the economy. Well, let me tell you, the fact is that we left the Labor government, if not the best, one of the best and strongest post-COVID economies in the OECD and, in fact, in the world. That is a fact. And now, with the procession of Labor Party members and senators and ministers saying, oh, we didn't realise that we'd actually have to govern, we actually have to make decisions to deliver the promises we made Australians. And it's somebody else's fault. It, oh, it's somebody else's fault. We didn't actually read the budget papers for, you know, last, for the last year or the year before or the year before that. We didn't actually read any of the documents to actually understand the state of the economy. And they supported at the time the decisions we made to save Australians' health and the economy during COVID. You supported all of those at the time, and now you're saying, Order. oh, Senator now Reynolds those from... opposites are saying, oh, we didn't really realise that that meant we'd have to make some hard decisions and we'd have to do things, some tough things, to deliver on our promises. Instead, they're just breaking promise after promise after promise. And the impact is severe for people in Western Australia. Western Australia has experienced the biggest jump in their grocery bills, which have now, since this, uh, those opposite came into government, by more than a third, more than a third in less than 12 months. Increases in grocery prices add up to an additional just under $2,000 per year per household for Western Australians. It is money they cannot afford. With nine consecutive interest Order. rate rises, Western Australians expired. are suffering. Resume your seat. The time for the discussion has expired, and I'll now proceed. To